Um, all right, so let's hop into an interview with you, Sam, since you actually also wrote a problem. Yeah, so, I wrote. Yeah, summarize your problem. Which which one did you saw? Did you write? So I wrote problem E, which was Marble Maze. Um, Marble Maze. I so every year there's kind of there's one problem that gets like massively misestimated. And this year, I think it's probably Marble Maze. You can see here that, like, in the list of titles, we put it, it's the first of the mi medium difficulty So th those problems. weren't in order. They weren't really in order, but it's still, it's, 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 I think it wound up being a little more in difficult than I intended. The, the format of the problem is you have a two-dimensional grid, and you have to track how marbles move around on that grid to predict their end positions. Algorithmically, it's not actually that difficult. You need to keep track of a little bit of state for each square in the grid. And other than that, it's just a loop. You just keep moving the mar marbles. There's not actually that much to get hung up on. So um, here's the here's our if if you can look at that uh, the problem description, you can you can see um, down here in the the sample. Maybe you can explain what the, the sample input yeah. means. So in the sample input here, um, in most CADIS problems, you've got kind of the first couple lines of input are mostly just there to provide some metadata around the problem, like how many lines of input they'll be below. Um, that's not really interesting. What's really interesting is this grid here you can see made up of like arrows and dots. That is the board on which these marble marbles are moving around. So if you imagine a marble starts at the top of that grid there, uh, the first top arrow means it moves downward. Um, then the horizontal line means that it either moves left or right, it'll alternate. Um, and then it falls off either side of the board. And that's then what the, the students have to output is which side it falls off on. So what was your what was your inspiration for this problem? I have been obsessed recently with following the completion of the Marl Machine X, which is a enormously over, it's an in, it's, it's, it's a monument to over-engineering, uh, courtesy of Martin, a self-taught engineer working out of France. Um, first Marl Machine was just a fun YouTube project he had. Um, now he's working on the second iteration, which is much more complicated and fun. Um, but in that machine, he has to route marbles between all these different instruments, and he was doing that with these, in the first machine, with these seesaws that would alternate them in either direction. And I was like, that would make a great uh, high school programming competition problem. The actual format of the problem, that's the story, the actual format of the problem is very sim similar to a esoteric programming language called Malbodge. Not, no, Befunge. Malbodge is a very different language. Befunge. But fun is like this, where it's a 2D grid, and you move around on the grid to figure out what the program will do. Uh, so how do you expect teams to solve this problem? Um, and kind of like, what uh, what things do you think are going to trip them up? And is there any submission that you would like to take a look at? <laughs> so I suppose we'll just look at the first person to solve it. All right, I'll, I'll get that set up the, while you talk. The the thing I most expected to trip people up is that each marble moves through the maze kind of independently. And there's, that means that each of the seesaws in the problem has to be tracked independently. And I thought it might be fairly easy for a team to screw that up and accidentally mix up uh, a couple of seesaws. Um, but really, Really, the problem is not actually that computationally difficult. You can solve this in relatively few lines of code, as I think we're about to see. Um, it's just, I think it's, it, I think it wound up being a very intimidating looking problem. It sounds very complex, and there's a lot of these rules. There's a lot really of text in the, in the description. Yeah, there's a lot of text. It's really only once you get into the code. It's a lot like that problem we talked about, incline, where it's this whole story, but in the end, you only need to multiply two numbers. I think it's like a bigger version of that. It's this whole story. It's really complicated rules, but then it reduces to something that's fairly simple code-wise. So let's look at this. Uh, this is the first solution. This was uh, from River Hill High School Team 2. They solved this at 16 minutes. 
Um, and they solved it in Python, it looks like. So that's uh, it's interesting to see the languages that people are using. Um, this is, yeah, just looking at this right now, it's, it's basically exactly uh, my Python solution. It looks, yeah, this is, this is exactly how you do it. Oh, except what is interesting is that you're using a queue. Some multi, yeah, so I think they looked again. This is sort of validating. See, we all estimated this problem as low difficulty because the way we did the difficulty estimation is we basically just said like what algorithms are required. And in this, you don't need any sort of complex algorithm, so it got a really low difficulty estimation. But I guess looking at the problem, it's very easy to think it's a sort of big graph search algorithm. Um, like it looked Nightwalk, like they, 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 K. they solved it with that. Yeah, so they kind of set this up as a graph search algorithm. They set up this whole queue as if you were doing a breadth first search. But if you actually look at the code, and they must have realized this eventually as they came close to a solution, but then at that point, there's no point in fixing it, and that the queue only ever has one element here, I think, right? If you scroll down, or right? Does it actually, there's always they, just, does it actually branch. Oh, but they, oh, Wait, oh, it does branch. So they are actually Why does it branch. How Sam, do they get the right answer? They're they're actually computing all of them at the same time or something. No, but oh wait, really? They are. You're right. Yeah. So this. Okay. Is... So one of so there was there is an ambiguity there is an ambiguity in the problem, which is whether all the marbles fall into the maze simultaneously or go one after the other. I tried to clarify in the description that they go one after the other because it's easier to implement, but it is. But, but all of the inputs are chosen so that you get the same answer either way. And in this case, oh, you know what they're doing? Some are scrolling down a little bit further. Okay, I, I'm wrong. I started this out saying this looks fairly normal, but it's not. So they're actually, I think, tracing all possible routes through the and maze. And like almost a, like a probability distribution or something. Yeah, and then at the end. Yeah, because look, see, they add, add results. So at the end, yeah, so then they've got this results array. Can you scroll up just a little bit more? So when do they, when do they... How do they limit the number of results? Because you do not, it, here's the thing, some of these mazes are huge. Some of these mazes have like tens of thousands or hundreds of maybe millions of different possible like outputs. So I'm actually really surprised that tracing all of them, the team was able to um, like complete in the execution time limit they've been given. Scroll back down. Again. I don't. Th well, see, they aren't complete. They aren't doing every single marble, or they're, they're they just are, computing though, the. Every fork, they're doubling the number of possibilities. Oh, that's true. And they're not really doing any sort of deduplication. Huh. I admit, I'm not actually entirely sure. Oh, four i in range. Okay, so then that's how they. This is where they're doing the actual iteration over the the marbles. Yeah. This is a this is a really interesting solution for sure. I, I think let's let's move on. Um, yeah, this is on. confusing me too much, so <laughs> we'll go back to just. Uh, um, yeah, I guess uh, obviously that's a surprising approach. Um, and they got this problem first, which is like really surprising that they took this very complex approach and still got first. I guess the problem was sufficiently intimidating that a lot of teams didn't go for the simple solution right off the bat mm -hmm. to get it done quickly. So, uh, how many teams do you expect to solve this? This is a problem E. Well, we have currently 15 teams who have solved. I was originally going to, I would have said if we weren't this late in the competition, I would, starting out, I would say probably half the teams. Um, I think it's clear at this point that we aren't going to get to that level. I think, though, see, as we get later into competition, as we get in the last hour and a half or so, I think teams are going to have a bit of an opportunity. To, they'll have read through all the descriptions at that point. They'll really understand each of the problems, and they'll, they'll get a more clear idea of what the difficulty levels are. And so I think at that point, we'll, we'll start seeing more and more marble maze solutions come in, and maybe these the, the, the really four hard problems 
it'll start overtaking those in terms of number solved. Um, but yeah, soon, I, yeah I, I was surprised by how few I think teams are going to wind up solving this. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see that for sure. Um, this is, this is, you can just solve this, not with a queue or anything, just keeping track of one marble at a time going through the maze. And you absolutely, can do this and that's, that's the time, that's, that time step method is what I used when I wrote my solution for yeah. it. 